Thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Tanya and Allison, for the warm welcome. Thanks to you all for being here. Uh, it was really inspiring to hear about all the, the amazing uh, programs and projects that you guys go oh, get closer. Oh, right, because the, the okay, let me, let me just move the laptop then. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I've, you know, I've, I've spoken uh, about beavers in many places and many venues. This is my first umbrella warehouse. Uh, so there are, you know, some of the, some of the logistics I'm still working out. Um, anyway, as I, as I mentioned last night uh, at, the, at the panel, uh, these days I live in Salida on the wrong side of the mountains, uh, but I am a former Paonia resident um, working for High Country News. And actually my passion for beavers uh, emerged from a few High Country News stories that I wrote back in uh, 2014 and 15. So, you know, for me to be back here in, uh, in the Valley is, uh, is really kind of a, a fun, special, um, full circle moment. Um, so this talk does have some visual aids. Uh, so, you know, if you can just sort of, ideally you'd be able to see a screen. There are some screens scattered about, but uh, just, you know, keep an eye on those. Um, anyway, so tonight I'll be talking about working with beavers, um, you know, through the use of long-term, uh, of low-tech process-based restoration uh, and other techniques um, to kind of achieve various restoration goals. But before we sort of launch into how you partner or collaborate with beavers, I think it's an important to just establish a few basic facts uh, about these animals who are our incredibly valuable partners. What is a, what is a beaver anyway? Um, and you know, I know that all uh, beaver experts probably in the North Fork Valley, um, but obviously they're rodents. Uh, they're North America's largest rodent. Uh, you know, typically 50 to 60 pounds as an adult beaver. So they're, they're pretty hefty. You know, usually you just see the, the head cruising along with the mass submerged like an iceberg, but they're, uh, you know, quite a bit bigger than you, than you realize, I think. Uh, and of course they're, they're semi-aquatic rodents, right? So they spend all of their lives pretty much uh, in and around water. And they've got a few wonderful adaptations for this uh, extraordinary semi-aquatic life. They've got uh, remarkably dense fur, right? They've got as many individual uh, pieces of hair on a postage stamp size patch of skin as we have on our entire heads. Uh, so remarkably dense pelts, which of course were their downfall, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, they've got a second set of eyelids, transparent eyelids called nictitating membranes that function as goggles underwater. Uh, they've got a second set of lips they can close behind their front teeth so they can chew and drag branches underwater without drowning. That's actually my favorite beaver adaptation. I think that's, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, and then what's a beaver's most recognizable feature? What makes a beaver a beaver? The tail, right. Uh, the tail is really kind of a cool um, multi-purpose appendage. It's a, a kickstand out on land. It's a rudder while they swim. Uh, it's a fat storage device. They actually put on fat for the winter uh, in their tails. Uh, and of course, and it's, alar it's an alarm system, right? I mean, who's ever heard of beaver tail slap? Uh, obviously, they do that to warn other beavers about the presence of potential predators. So if you hear that tail slap, you're probably the predator. Uh, and then the, the other kind of wonderful beaver feature uh, is their teeth. Uh, as you can see, uh, the top and bottom, well, you can sort of see, but the top and bottom sets of incisors basically act like self-sharpening chisels. Uh, the teeth are also orange, uh, and that's because they're actually sort of structurally and chemically fortified with iron that beavers derive from their foods. They've got these wonderful iron-reinforced teeth, uh, which is obviously valuable when you spend your whole life cutting down trees, right? Uh, beavers eat cambium, which is the inner bark of trees. Uh, what, are, what are beavers' preferred food species? What, do, what trees do beavers eat? Aspen, what else? Willow, what else? Cat, cottonwood, yeah. I mean, those are, those are the big three uh, in the West. Uh, but they'll take just about any deciduous tree. They do tend to avoid conifers. Uh, and they also eat lots of green herbaceous stuff as well. You know, cattails, water lilies. I've seen them basically mow people's lawns for them. Uh, so they're, you know, they're, what's, they're what scientists call choosy generalists, right? They've got a few species they really like, but you know, they'll take just about anything. They are totally uh, herbivorous, as I'm sure you all know. They never eat fish. Uh, those are otters. Um, so of course, in addition to uh, eating the cambium, the inner bark of trees, they also fell trees to use the wood as construction material. Uh, and there are two basic types of beaver structure uh, that you've probably all seen. The first, what would you, what would you call that? That's a, that's a lodge, yeah, that's the basic beaver housing unit. Uh, in there, you've got two to as many as eight or so beavers. That's the mother and father, the generally monogamous uh, mating pair. You've got the newborn 
kits, the baby beavers, the one-year-olds, and the two-year-olds. So you've got three year classes of offspring all cohabitating in the lodge, uh, you know, kind of helping each other out. Younger siblings being raised by older siblings. Uh, you know, nice little nuclear family, very uh, recognizable for us humans. Um, you know, often you see these island lodges right in the middle of the pond. Uh, that's, a, that's in uh, Maroon Lake at the base of the Maroon Bells. Um, but, you know, you do see uh, kind of these bank-attached attached logs frequently, uh, as well as these pretty inconspicuous bank burrows that are just kind of co covered by a, a heap of sticks. And that's actually, that's my dog, Kit, who is named for a baby beaver. <laughs> so that's, that's, the, that's the lodge. That's the kind of the fundamental beaver housing unit. Uh, and then, of course, what would you call that thing? That's the dam, right. Why do beavers build dams? What is the point of this really unique, bizarre, specialized behavior? Uh, well, a beaver out on land uh, is basically a fat, slow, smelly package of meat, right? Uh, they get eaten by, by bears, by uh, wolves here in Colorado pretty soon, uh, and cougars. I mean, any large carnivore is going to take a beaver, right? So by, you know, building that dam and, and expanding and deepening that pond, they're basically just engineering their own shelter. So instead of having, instead of having to walk over land to that good-looking aspen tree and risk being, you know, being eaten by a cougar, they can swim to it instead, cut it down, float it back to the, to the lodge. And the, you know, the dams come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Not all beavers build dams, right? I mean, the point of the dam is to create this nice deep pool of water. So that if they already have deep water, they're fine, right? Obviously, there are, you know. 10,000 beavers in the Gunnison River, they're not building dams, but you know, they're living inconspicuously in banks very happily. So not all beavers build dams, they're really doing that you know, in these higher order uh, tributaries. Uh, the dams come in all shapes and sizes. Here's a really nice one up Clear Creek uh, near where I live. I just love that kind of perfect uh, radial arc. That's a very scenic dam. Um, often you see these kind of terrace systems where beavers basically control control the grade of the stream by backing up water and, you know, kind of creating a system of locks, essentially, um, you know, and, and thus kind of gentle the stream and, and slow the flow. Uh, I love those. I love those little terraces. Uh, and, you know, most, look, most dams don't look like this, but given enough uh, time and, uh, you know, lack of human pressure, this is the kind of really spectacular thing they can create and is obviously the work of, you know, many successive generations of beavers all adding their stick to the pile. So, you know, a typical beaver colony is building one big primary dam, usually not that big, obviously, uh, and then a number of secondary dams. So, you know, you can have a single colony of beavers, uh, you know, building 15 to 20 dams in, in some cases. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm always really impressed by their hydrological savvy. I feel like if you took an engineer from the Army Corps and, you know, put her on a stream and said, okay, build a dam that minimizes labor and maximizes the total impoundment, she would put it exactly where the beavers would, right? So here's a, you know, just a beautiful 300 acre or so pond created by a single dam uh, at sort of the constriction point on a, on a, in a little canyon. Um, so this is, you know, this is 15 foot of, foot of dam, you know, backing up 300 acres of water. I think that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, and then the other wonderful thing that beavers do that we don't talk about that we don't talk about enough, I think, is they're also prolific canal diggers, right? Uh, they're really amazing excavators as well as uh, builders, and they dig these elaborate networks of canals up into the forest. And again, you know, that's so they can swim up those canals safely, cut down a tree, float it back uh, to the pond, you know, all without leaving leaving the water too much, and uh, you know, kind of minimizing their own their own labor there. And that's a really important way that beavers spread water out uh, onto the floodplain is by digging those canals and just, uh, you know, pushing water out, out laterally. <clears throat> so, of course, beavers are, are building these dams and creating these ponds and canals uh, to maximize their own habitat and shelter, but in the process, they're providing all kinds of wonderful ecosystem services for us humans. And if you're at the film last night, you know, you're familiar with these. Um, but, you know, a few really important services worth highlighting, you know, Jake talked about the second snowpack, right? The idea that beavers are capturing huge volumes of water. And as we lose our snowpack, well, you know, we have to store that water up in the high country somehow. And beavers do that really well. Where is, where is that? You guys, does that, does that look familiar? That's, that's, that's Independence Pass. That's, the, that's, that's the, the, the Roaring Fork. Those are the headwaters of the Roaring Fork. And you can see that, I mean, each one of these you know, each one of these linear features, right, is a beaver dam. And beavers are, you know, taking this little sinuous meandering stream and just arresting it uh, and storing hundreds of thousands, if not millions of gallons of water uh, in this little valley and ensuring there's still going to be water 
uh, especially cold water in the Roaring Fork, you know, come uh, July, August, September, the hot, dry season. Uh, I think one other thing worth highlighting here is, look, there's, you know, there's all of the visible surface water you can see, but what you don't see, of course, is that floodplain basically acting like a sponge, and as beavers push water out laterally, it's soaking into the ground and very slowly traveling downstream and then percolating back up through the stream bed, right? So beavers are storing five to 10 times as much groundwater as surface water in any given uh, impoundment. So that's water storage. Uh, the other fa fantastic beaver service is flood attenuation, right? So, you know, you get this big pulse of, uh, you know, potentially destructive runoff racing downstream and it hits those ponds and wetlands and, you know, it's pushed out laterally under the floodplain, it's captured in the ground, it's stored in the pond. Uh, so, you know, there have been studies showing that beavers are capturing about 30% of any given large flood event, right? So that's kind of magical to contemplate briefly. You know, we've got drought on one end, flooding on the other end, these two kind of climate change exacerbated problems, and beavers are helping us tackle both uh, by kind of stabilizing that, you know, peaky hydrograph. So I think that's kind of a cool, you know, we think about beavers as kind of agents of flooding, right? But they're really agents of flood control. That's an important point. Another fabulous thing beavers do is, of course, they're fantastic at capturing pollutants, right? You, get, you know, you get the streams racing along, it's carrying nitrates, phosphates, heavy metals from historic mining, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and, you know, and then it, then it hits that beaver dam, you know, the flow slows down. All of those suspended solids have a chance to settle out. Uh, they're also sequestering huge amounts of carbon, right? So you can see that, you know, that's this wonderful kind of organic matter rich uh, cake, essentially, that's formed over, uh, you know, many, many decades. So, there, you know, again, there have been lots of studies showing that beavers are really wonderful agents of, uh, of pollution control and especially nitrate uh, capture. And then the other fabulous beaver service that, you know, we're learning more and more about, right, is they create wonderful fire breaks and fire refugia. Obviously, water doesn't burn, and by spreading water out, beavers are creating these incredible fireproof landscapes. They're also, by irrigating plants, you know, creating these wonderful lush green riparian areas. Obviously, a, you know, a moist green plant is less flammable than a dry, brown, crispy one. So beavers, by spreading water out and by irrigating landscapes, uh, are creating these wonderful fire breaks and, and refugia. And here you can see this is in Idaho. Uh, you know, all of the uplands just burnt to a crisp. And the last green, wet, blue place in the landscape is that beaver-created valley bottom. So those are the things that beavers do for us. Uh, they're also, of course, keystone species for other organisms, right? Uh, you know, the keystone is the top block in a stone arch. When you pull that block out, the whole arch crumbles, and beavers are likewise disproportionately supporting ecosystems. Uh, it's basically impossible to name a species that doesn't benefit from beavers at some point in its life cycle. You know, wetlands are 2% uh, of the land area and support 80% of the biodiversity in the West. Uh, a few obvious beneficiaries, uh, you know, waterfowl and wading birds, that's a great blue heron rookery uh, around a beaver complex near Crested Butte. Uh, moose and mink and uh, muskrat, other semi-aquatic mammals, very happy uh, in and around beaver complexes. What's, what's that? That's a boreal toad. Yeah, that's you know, one of our iconic amphibians here in uh, Colorado. And boreal toads in much of their range are basically beaver pond obligates. About 90% of their breeding habitat uh, is beaver ponds. So that's a, an animal just inextricable from beavers. Uh, here's kind of a, a cool one. Um, this is in, uh, in Minnesota. This is an old, uh, sort of a former beaver pond. The beavers left, the dam broke down, the pond, train, the pond drained, leaving a uh, kind of a, an isolated lodge. Uh, and a pack of wolves actually moved into that lodge and raised their pups in there. Uh, so that's, that's the kind of amazing thing that we could see in Colorado in the next couple of years uh, as wolves return. And here's just one, you know, one more that I, I, I just love. Uh, so this is in Utah. We were, my friend and I were walking along um, you know, this, this beaver pond. We saw a sandhill crane uh, walking atop the beaver dam. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. I've never seen a, a crane in a beaver pond before. So I took that picture and then later looked closely at the crane's feet and maybe you can see she built a nest and laid two eggs atop that beaver dam. So again, that's you know, the, the kind of thing that you would never see in a peer-reviewed paper, at least I haven't, but you know, when you visit beaver ponds, you just can't help but be amazed at the, the quantity of life, right? There are all of these amazing biological connections that are just so much fun to observe. Uh, and then you know, one of the most important 
beaver beneficiaries that's really, I think, driving a lot of beaver interest is salmonids, right? This is a juvenile uh, steelhead, you know, kind of an ocean-going rainbow trout in uh, Oregon. But, you know, of course, here we've got cutthroat trout, uh, also do very well in and around beaver ponds. And look, obviously, if you're a baby, a baby salmonid, you know, you don't want to live in the free-flowing, uh, you know, main stem Gunnison River that's just going to blow you downstream. You want that, you know, that complex side channel, meander, eddy, kind of that those slow water refuge habitats, right? And that's what beavers create. So there are, again, many, many studies linking uh, beavers to, uh, to juvenile fish production. And, uh, you know, one common objection that you hear from fish biologists and some anglers, right, is that, you know, wait a second, we're trying to take dams out of streams, not put more dams into streams. But obviously, uh, you know, a beaver dam is nothing like a big uh, concrete dam. Uh, you know, fish uh, swim around them, they wriggle through them, they go, they go over them. Um, this is, uh, you know, this is more anecdote than data, obviously. But, you know, here's a, a little uh, beaver dam outside of Seattle. Um, there's the... Uh, the beaver pond, and there are the two freshly excavated coho salmon uh, reds or nests. So at least two fish had no problem getting past uh, that beaver dam. And interestingly, there's, there have been studies in Colorado and Utah basically showing that cutthroat trout, because they're co-evolved with beavers, uh, ne they negotiate beaver dams more readily than non-native brown or brook trout um, because, you know, again, they're co-evolved. So beaver dams kind of act as a filter for native species, uh, which is sort of interesting to think about. Um, and in fact, you know, the evolutionary connection between beavers and fish is so deep uh, that it inspired my favorite bumper sticker, which is that beavers taught salmon to jump, right? I think that gets at that, that evolutionary connection. So today, you know, we don't really know how many beavers live in North America. The best guess is 10 to 20 million, right? So they're not an endangered species. You know, they're not going to go extinct uh, in, our, in our lifetimes. Uh, and that sounds pretty good, right? But then you start to wonder, well, wait a second, how many beavers did North America used to have uh, prior to European arrival? And if you watched the movie last night, you're disqualified from, from answering this question. Um, but any guesses about how many beavers used to live in North America? Somebody just throw a number out there. Yeah. 500 million? Yeah, that's, you know, that's in the right ballpark. Um, the best, you know, we don't really have a great estimate again, but you know, the best guess is that there are as many as 400 million beavers uh, in North America. Uh, you know, a little back of the envelope math says that they would have created, let's say, 200 million beaver ponds, uh, and that all of those ponds would have collectively impounded about 230,000 square miles, uh, which, for reference, is about the size of Arizona and Nevada put together, right? So a huge amount of this continent's landmass was underwater, uh, thanks to thanks to beavers. And, you know, I think it's, you probably can't read this quote, but I think it's important to note, of course, that this idea of Beavers being ecological engineers and keystone species is something that you know, native people have known for many thousands of years. Uh, there were certain tribes like the Blackfeet in Montana that actually had cultural prohibitions against killing beavers uh, and therefore did not take part in the fur trade because they knew, hey, you know, in these arid western landscapes, you know, these are keystone species that are creating watering holes for the elk and the bison and the other species that are, you know, culturally uh, and subsistence-wise um, important to us. Um, so, you know, again, this is all of these kind of ecosystem services that I'm describing uh, is, you know, so, something that, that western science is really rediscovering, um, but, you know, native people have known for, for thousands of years, certainly, uh, and that would have been true for the, the Ute as well, of course. Uh, and, you know, when I was working on uh, my book about beavers, you know, one of the things I tried to do is go back through old trappers' journals and explorers' diaries and railroad survey reports, just trying to understand, you know, what a fully beavered North America would have looked like and, and how it would have functioned. Uh, and there are all kinds of just incredible, mind-blowing accounts, uh, you know, explorers crossing, uh, you know, to what, um, southeast Wyoming, which is desert today, and finding these incredible lush marshes full of waterfowl, uh, you know, trappers crossing uh, the state of Indiana and not finding a dry place to camp for 100 miles because beavers had ponded everything up. Uh, again, this is probably a hard quote to read, but it's basically Lewis and Clark uh, going up the, uh, the Missouri River describing seeing beaver dams in every single tributary of the Missouri as far as the eye could see uh, up to the base of the mountains. And in fact, the Corps of Discovery had to, in many places, they had, they had to walk along the ridge lines uh, because the beavers had so thoroughly ponded everything up. 
So that was in 1805 uh, that Lewis and Clark saw beavers in every tributary as far as the eye could see. Uh, in 1843, John James Audubon, of course, the naturalist and painter, traveled the same route up the Missouri, and he couldn't find a single beaver uh, in, in the same watershed where they'd been ubiquitous uh, just 38 years before. So what happened to all those beavers? What did they turn into? Hats, right, exactly. Uh, you know, we hear beaver hat and think of like a big fluffy Davy Crockett type thing, but in fact, they were these kind of elegant Victorian top hats. Uh, you know, and the fur trade begins in New England in the early 1600s and very rapidly spreads west and south across the continent. Uh, and, you know, by 1845 or so, uh, it's almost impossible to find a beaver in the lower 48. They're essentially functionally extinct. And there's, you know, there's a lot of fascinating fur trade history that we could get into, but I think that the, you know, the operative point here is that wiping out 400 million beavers was a profound ecological disaster, right? You know, we, we don't really think about the fur trade in the same terms as we think about, you know, overgrazing or the deforestation of New England or the busting of the sod in the Midwest, right? But really, in many ways, you know, beaver trapping was one of the, the first massive alterations of the North American landscape. Um, <clears throat> You know, you, I mean, you, just, you destroy 400 million beaver dams and, you know, a couple hundred million beaver ponds break down uh, and all of those, you know, all of that uh, wonderful pond and wetland habitat is, is lost. Um, and it's, you know, it, again, it's hard to kind of wrap our heads around, I think, what an ecological catastrophe this, this would have been. Um, you know, one quick metric of that is, you know, there have been studies showing that uh, coho salmon in the Northwest uh, lost about 97% of their juvenile rearing habitat um, as a result of the loss of beavers. And certainly that would have been true of cutthroat trout, boreal toads, moose, wood ducks, you name it, right? So the fur trade, again, was this ecological catastrophe. And we talk about process-based restoration, you know, we're really setting things right, right? We're trying to remediate or pay reparations uh, to this, uh, this kind of fur apocalypse that uh, occurred over, over a few centuries. So, <clears throat> you know, fortunately, uh, by 1900 or so, you know, we'd started to wise up. Beavers were virtually extinct uh, in the lower 48, but, you know, we began to reintroduce them and, you know, enact trapping restrictions, and slowly uh, beavers started to, uh, to, to come back. And I guess the question that, you know, we have, to, we have to answer now is, how do we bring them back further, right? How do we, how do we take this process of beaver recovery that began, uh, you know, in, in the early 1900s and, uh, you know, sort of fulfill it, right? What does it mean to restore these animals and how do we accomplish that? So you know, I like to think of, of beaver restoration activities occurring across a, a kind of spectrum um, from passive to active. And there are sort of four main buckets of things we can do to restore beavers along this spectrum, right? The first is coexistence, just learning to live with these. And I'll talk about each of these things, you know, in more depth in a second. But, you know, how do we learn to live with these animals and non-lethally solve the, the inevitable problems they cause, right? The second point on the spectrum is landscape management. What can we do, uh, you know, especially on public lands, uh, to create the conditions in which these animals can thrive. The third is beaver mimicry, right? Building beaver dam analogs and, and sort of helping these animals along uh, and also trying to emulate them. Uh, and then the fourth point on the spectrum is, is active relocation, right? Actually physically moving these animals and putting them back out on the landscape uh, in places we want them to uh, do, their, do their thing. So let's just talk about each of these kind of points on the spectrum uh, in turn, and, and we'll, we'll start with coexistence. So look, obviously I'm a, I'm a shameless uh, beaver apologist, but even I recognize that, hey, these are some pretty challenging animals to coexist with, right? It turns out that good beaver habitat and good human habitat is the same habitat. You know, we both like uh, low gradient streams and kind of fertile broad valley bottoms. And, uh, you know, I'd argue that we're the nuisance species more than they are. Uh, but, you know, there's no question that when beavers and humans co-occur, uh, you know, challenges can result, right? So here's a set of, uh, of railroad tracks in Massachusetts, this big, you know, multi-million dollar uh, track project. And within three months of these tracks being completed, beavers had them underwater. Uh, who's, who's seen something like this before? Is this a, a familiar view, right? So beavers love damming and road culverts because if you're a beaver, you know, the road bed is like the greatest dam in the world and the culvert is the leak in the dam. And, you know, what do beavers do? They plug up leaks, right? Uh, so, you know, the water rises, the road washes out, very uh, expensive and uh, time consuming to maintain. Uh, here's a, this is a cool picture. This is, this is near Taos. I just kind of stumbled across this cabin a few years ago. 
uh, you can see the beavers have this cabin totally underwater. And I, and I like this picture because what you can sort of see is so the beavers begin their dam up here in the, low, in the upper left corner. They dam to the base of the cabin. Then they incorporate the cabin in the dam and then they keep going on the right side, right? So, you know, I, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't want to be that landowner, but yet you have to admire the ingenuity there. Uh, and then, you know, they, I, mean, they, I mean, they get into all kinds of creative mischief. Here's a, a beaver that broke into a dollar store in Maryland and was browsing the plastic Christmas tree aisle when it was apprehended by the authorities, right? So they do all kinds of, all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, the way that these sorts of conflicts are almost invariably handled is by killing the offending beaver, right? Which makes sense. You know, the beaver's causing a problem. Get the beaver out of there. Uh, every year, Wildlife Services, the federal agency, kills uh, 20 to 25,000 beavers. Um, and certainly private nuisance trappers kill absolutely tens and, you know, maybe hundreds of thousands more. We don't really know how many beavers are, are killed. Um, but, you know, certainly the number is uh, enormous. And, uh, you know, again, there's a, a logic to that. Um, but, you know, the issue with that is, is several fold. I mean, first, of course, when you kill those beavers, you know, you're also eliminating the potential for that great, you know, pond and wetland habitat that we care about. But also, you know, all you're doing really is creating a vacancy sign for the next family of beavers, right? As long as that culvert is beckoning them, they're always going to come back. So there are all of these communities, you know, all, all over the, the, uh, the country and certainly here in Colorado that are engaged in these very expensive uh, and I would argue ecologically kind of nonsensical cycles of trapping and recolonization and trapping and recolonization, right? And last night, one of the question askers at the panel mentioned a, a guy around here, a trapper who killed 100 beavers in 2022 alone. And, you know, that's, I mean, that just seems like a, a public policy failure more than anything, right? So you start to wonder, I mean, how do we live with these animals? You know, are there, are there more cost-effective and certainly ecologically effective uh, strategies we can employ? Um, and so <clears throat> here's one good example of coexistence. So, you know, lots of beavers get killed for cutting down trees, uh, you know, people's uh, fruit trees uh, around here, certainly, you know, ornamental trees. And I just don't think that a beaver should ever be killed for cutting down a tree. That's just too easy a problem to solve, right? So here's a kind of a cool case study. I really like this. This is, this is in Salida. This is at Sands Lake, uh, if you guys have ever been there. Um, and so in this case, the Central Colorado Conservancy had these, you know, these beautiful old cottonwoods they wanted to protect from the beavers which is fine, you know, so they, fen they fenced off those cottonwood trees, right, with a nice, you know, kind of thick gauge wire. Uh, and then they left unfenced the non-native Siberian elm trees, which the beavers took down, right? So that's invasive vegetation management using beavers as your agent. That's kind of, you know, the, the uh, sort of a cool example of creative thinking, uh, I think. Um, here's, uh, you know, so when, when beavers cause flooding, that's, you know, kind of a a more challenging problem to solve, but there too we've got options, right? This is a contraption called a beaver deceiver uh, with its inventor, Skip Lyle. And uh, you know, it's a pretty simple device. Uh, it's basically a pipe that you run into the road culvert or through the, through the beaver dam. Uh, so you're, you're just creating a leak, right? You're moving water from the upstream side uh, of the dam uh, or the culvert to the downstream side. Uh, the fencing is there to keep the beavers from plugging up those pipe ends, right? Because they, they, will, they will do that. Uh, here's a kind of a very low-tech, kind of crappy version, honestly, that, uh, you know, some colleagues and I put in. Um, this is near Spokane, where I used to live. Uh, and, you know, and here you can see, I mean, this pipe has been in for, you know, an hour, and we've already dropped the level of these, of the, of the pond there and the trees, uh, you know, a, a foot or two. Um, and, uh, you know, allow, allowing that landowner to uh, access the entirety of her property by dropping that, that water level and alleviating that flooding. And that's, uh, don't use that. Um, pipe as a, an example because it's not, not, not well engineered, um, but, you know, it illustrates the basic concept, right? You're just creating a leak, moving water from the upstream side to the downstream side, and just striking a balance between the needs of humans and the, the needs of the rodents, right? Here's kind of a, a, better, a better model uh, built by Mike Callahan, and, you know, I, I know you can't see those statistics, but basically, you know, studies have shown that these things are 85 to 95 percent effective, right? So there are some situations in which you know, this is probably not an ideal solution and trapping might be necessary, but, you know, no question, there are many, many thousands of sites, of conflict sites all over the country that we're currently managing uh, lethally where we could be using these kind of creative non-lethal approaches as well, right? So, you know, I, th I think that, that that point, the coexistence point of the spectrum, I mean, that's, that's honestly the most important one, right? Just don't kill these animals and they'll do a pretty, a pretty good job at recolonizing the landscape and, you know, and solving our problems for us. Um, but, you know, in some cases, there are other things we can do. 
uh, to kind of help them out. And the second point on our spectrum is landscape management. So what, is, what does that mean? Well, here's a, a really famous case study from the annals of beaverdom. Uh, this is a stream called Maggie Creek, which is in Elko County in Northeast Nevada. Uh, and this is, this is what Maggie Creek looked like in 1980 after about a, about, a, about a century of unmanaged cattle grazing, right? So you get cattle, you know, hanging out in that stream bottom, eating all the riparian vegetation, kind of catastrophic erosion, and you get this totally brown, lifeless, kind of destitute channel. So in 1995 or so, uh, the ranchers who, you know, who ran, uh, who ranched this allotment and the Bureau of Land Management sort of got together and they said, you know, hey, wait a second, what can we do to let this stream recover a little bit? And they just kind of changed, changed the, uh, the grazing rotations a little bit, just got the cows out of there in summer when plants are most heat stressed. You know, they did a little bit of riparian fencing in some parts of the watershed elsewhere, but they didn't, you know, they didn't do a whole lot. But, you know, by the kind of the late 90s, early 2000s, you know, that riparian cattail and willow and other vegetation had started to recover. And, you know, of course, guess who showed up? The beavers, right? Nobody reintroduced them. They just, have this, they just have this kind of magical way of finding available habitat. So this is what the stream looked like in 1980. Uh, the, next, the next picture I'm going to show is this, the same stream at pretty much the same place uh, in 2017 when I visited. Okay, so just keep this picture in mind and then check out that, right? That, that looks pretty good. Um, and you might say, well, wait a second, where are the, where are the beavers? Well, actually, all of, this, um, all of this cattail growth is growth atop an old beaver dam. So the beavers are really deeply embedded uh, into this system. So you can just look at this and say, okay, well, clearly this is, you know, this is healthier than that was. But, you know, there were scientists involved, so they, they quantified some of those changes. Uh, and one of the amazing things they found was that beavers actually added three miles of wetted stream length. So what does that mean? Well, when the stream was this degraded, it was actually going dry before reaching its confluence with the main stem Humboldt River, right? So by building dams and slowing water down, beavers ensured there would still be water in the stream come, you know, August, September, right? So beavers took a seasonal stream and made it perennial. That's pretty unbelievable. Uh, and there are, you know, lots of, lots of examples of this all over, the, all over the West, including in Colorado. Beavers also added two feet to the water table, right? Again, there's all of the visible surface water you see. What you don't see is all the water soaking into the ground, recharging aquifers, uh, you know, raising that water table, and irrigating plants, right? Beavers are great irrigators. So beavers, in this, in this instance, uh, added 100 acres of riparian vegetation to this little valley, which is a big deal when you're this guy. This is uh, James Rogers. He's a rancher in Elko County. Um, not, not on that allotment, but, uh, you know, kind of a, a similar story in the same, the same general geography. And, you know, the point that James made to me, and again, this is a guy who's, you know, whose dad, who's dad's, who's dad killed beavers and whose dad, whose dad's dad killed beavers. And, uh, you know, and James pointed out that, you know, this, the, I mean, that floodplain is about uh, 10 times more productive, right? Because beavers are, are irrigating it for him. Uh, and that's, you know, that's more forage for his cattle and more weight on his cattle and, you know, more money in his back pocket. So now there's this fantastic little cluster of pro-beaver ranchers who have seen what can be achieved when you manage landscapes in ways that, you know, let these animals come back. And again, there are a million stories like this, you know, in, in every, every uh, state west of the Mississippi. So that's the kind of the second point on our spectrum. The third point is beaver mimicry, right? And I think this is really where the long-term process-based restoration stuff comes in. Uh, and, you know, beaver mimicry is basically the construction of, you know, beaver dam analogs. They have all kinds of names, you know, post-assisted log structures. Um, but, you know, the, the idea is pretty simple, right? Building human-created beaver dams that, you know, generally imitate what these animals do and create the conditions in which the animals then set themselves can thrive. And I think that's a really important point, right, is that when we lost beavers, we changed the landscape's capacity to support beavers. So what does that mean? Well, when you have a beaver-rich stream, all of those beaver dams are acting like speed bumps, right? They're slowing water down and spreading it out. And when you kill all those beavers, uh, you know, you lose all of those beaver-built speed bumps, and there's nothing checking the velocity of water, right? So you get this really rapid, dramatic, you know, catastrophic incision where the stream just cuts to bedrock. Uh, you know, I think that often we see that kind of incision. And we say, oh, that's the result of, you know, overgrazing or mining or some other historic impact. But this is actually a stream in, this is in Yellowstone National Park. So no other impact besides the loss of beavers. Uh, and this is, this is what results, right? So the challenge is that once this happens, 
beavers can't return to that stream, right? Because it's so incised, you know, the stream, the stream is basically like a fire hose, right? It's trapped between its banks. And any beaver who tries to dam in there is gonna have their dam blown away, right? And beavers want to spread water out onto the floodplain, but they can't reach the floodplain from down here, right? So this is, this is basically an impossible place to be a beaver. And again, you know, there are thousands and thousands of miles of streams that look like this, that desperately need restoration, but they can't support the animals that would restore them. So what do we do? Well, we build these beaver dam analogs, right? We, we provide a little bit of structure and stability for them to work off of. You know, we create these little dams, uh, they start to catch some sediment, they raise that, that stream bed up uh, a little bit. Um, as you can see, you know, broken fingers are one of the hazards of this uh, kind of work, but they're, you know, these structures are incredibly, I mean, that's where the low-tech process-based restoration comes in, right? They're very low-tech uh, and very cost-effective. And uh, I don't know how well you can see this, this graphic, but here's just a little, you know, kind of a nice illustration of how this works, right? You've got, um, you know, you've got an incised channel, you put in a couple of beaver dam analogs, you know, you push the, the stream channel out onto the floodplain, it captures some sediment, flows downstream, you know, the next beaver dam analog uh, picks up that sediment, you know, you build that stream bed up uh, very slowly, and, uh, you know, and now, and now the stream can reach its floodplain again, and once the stream can reach, reach the floodplain, you know, it becomes an enticing place for beavers to live, and, you know, they find their way uh, back into these systems. So I think that's, you know, a really important point, again, is that we're, you know, we're, we're imitating what the beavers can do, yes, but more important is that we're creating the conditions in which they themselves can thrive, right? Because they're going to do this work uh, a lot better than we can. The point is not the structures themselves. The point is the processes the structures facilitate, which allow the animals themselves to return and recover, right? That's what, that's what the low, that's what low tech PBR really is, I think, uh, you know, is letting the, letting the animals do the, do the work. Uh, and the place where this, you know, this kind of beaver dam analog technique was really pioneered was in, uh, in Oregon, in central Oregon, in a stream called Bridge Creek. Again, you know, a place impacted by beaver trapping and overgrazing. And, and there, uh, you know, scientists built 115 of these beaver dam analogs. Uh, the beavers, which had been in the system but were kind of struggling, uh, built 120 dams of their own. So they just went, you know, they just went gangbusters. Uh, <clears throat> the amount of... The inundated area more than doubled, right? So beavers and humans, again, pushing water out onto the floodplain, just expanding the width of that channel. Uh, and then the really cool upshot of that was a 12-fold increase in side channels, right? So, you know, it went from this single thread stream to this incredible maze of, you know, multi-threaded channels. Uh, and that was a really big deal for these guys. Again, this is a, a juvenile steelhead, a little, you know, sea run rainbow trout, uh, federally threatened in the, uh, in the Columbia River. Uh, and scientists saw a 50%, a 52% survival increase in those juvenile fish. So that's an unbelievable result, right? A 50% increase in the survival of a federally threatened species thanks to this beaver-human collaboration. And again, you know, of course, I know, I know you don't have steelhead here, um, but, you know, these, these sorts of projects are now being done for, you know, sage grouse in Nevada and, uh, you know, boreal toads in Utah and you name it. So, you know, these kinds of, of low-tech process-based restoration projects involving beaver dam analogs are just in increasingly popular um, for all kinds of ecological reasons. And again, you know, I just want to reiterate that the point is, the point is the beavers themselves, right? And, and here's, you know, I think sort of the ideal outcome in some ways. I mean, here, you, know, you, can, you can see, uh, you know, the beaver dam analog, you can see the skeleton of it, but obviously the beavers themselves have returned to the system and are doing a much better job maintaining the system uh, than, uh, than we ever could. So the final point on that, the, the beaver spectrum, and again, I think this is, and this came up last night in conversation on the panel, uh, but, you know, relocation is, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a method of last resort, right? It's not really what we want to do because a lot of the animals, you know, move on or they get eaten or, you know, who knows what happens to them. Um, but, you know, certainly it can be really effective in some, in some situations. Um, you know, here's a kind of a standard beaver live trap, a Hancock trap. Uh, you know, most of the projects who relocate beavers, right, they're capturing uh, quote unquote nuisance beavers on private land and moving them to public land far from people where they can, you know, again, build their dams and do their things. Um, as, as was mentioned last night, ideally, you know, you're, you're moving entire beaver colonies or families together, right? These are very, very family-oriented animals. If you separate beaver families, the young ones will certainly die. 
uh, and the old ones will kind of go wandering around looking for love until they get eaten by a cougar, right? So you want to move the beavers together so they just settle down and start building right away. This is uh, Sandy and Chomper uh, moving, moving to a, a new home. And here's just a, a, quick, a quick video of a, a beaver. I don't know how well you can see this. This is a, a beaver relocation in Wyoming a few years ago. I don't know if this is going to work or not. It usually does. Well, maybe not. Too bad. Okay, well, just, you know, just imagine. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so so if, if, you, if you would see this video, you would, ju you would just see a guy backing up a, a, a goat trailer basically to a creek and like herding two beavers out. And, uh, you know, certainly that can work. But, you know, now most of the beaver projects that exist, um, this is, you know, this is true uh, in, in Colorado to some extent as well, um, you know, they really emphasize site preparation, right? You want to give these animals a soft landing. If you, if you just dump them out there, you know, they're not going to have, a, you know, they're not going to have a pond. They're not going to have a lodge. They're probably going to get eaten. They're certainly going to move on. Uh, lots of beaver projects have really low success rates, unfortunately, um, for, that, for that reason. So now, you know, more and more projects are sort of, uh, again, doing site prep, you know, building beaver dam analogs, building these artificial lodges in some case, uh, just to give these animals, you know, kind of a, again a soft, a soft landing. And there's the beaver uh, getting getting comfortable in her new her new lodge um, until she can build a better lodge of her own, right? So again, you know, you generally don't want to just be dumping these animals out there. You want to create the conditions in which uh, they can they can thrive. I guess you know to finally, I, you know, the point that I want to emphasize is that you know we have these four points on this beaver spectrum, right? But they're not really isolated points, right? They all, they all work together. Um, because if you, if you don't take the coexistence measures, right, if you don't protect those culverts, there's no point in relocating animals on the landscape, right? They're just going to cause conflicts and uh, unfortunately get killed. Likewise, you know, beaver mimicry and beaver relocation go together really well, right? Building those beaver dam analogs and creating those nice deep pools creates a landscape in which you can uh, reintroduce beavers and ensure that they have some level of success, right? There are just amazing stories of, uh, you know, ranchers in Idaho who build, a, you know, a few beaver dam analogs, dump out a family of beavers, and, you know, a decade later, you know, you, get, you have 200 beaver dams in the system. Um, so, you know, you're not, you're not taking these measures in isolation, right? They all go together. They're all things that uh, enhance each other. And, you know, they're all just an integral part of uh, beaver stewardship and, and watershed management. So to sum it all up, you know, we've got this uh, amazing animal, uh, provides all of these ecological services for us and for other species. It does it all for free. And best of all, it doesn't need permits. That's really nice, right? So... As the mantra of the beaver believer goes, we've got to step back and let the rodent do the work, right? We should all get that tattooed on our shoulders or something. Um, so with that, I'll say thank you guys so much. There is, uh, I did write a book about this stuff. If this just whet your appetite for beaver content, um, there are uh, a bunch of signed copies at Paonia Books uh, if you're interested. Um, there's my email address. I'm always open to uh, beaver management consulting questions. Uh, and uh, I think we've got time for some, some questions now. So... Oh, well, ask questions. <laughs> okay. Sure. Thanks, Allison. Yeah. Okay. And 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 Alice, Allison, um, acting as my as my publicist, pointed out that I would I would be remiss if I didn't mention that I have a new book coming out uh, this September called Crossings, which is about uh, the science of road ecology, which is the study of how roads interact with nature and what we can do to make our, our landscapes more uh, porous or permeable to wildlife, um, you know, using things like uh, wildlife overpasses and underpasses. So if, um, yeah, that, if that's a topic that you're interested in, uh, the book is called Crossings, and it'll be out in September. So thanks a lot, Allison. Good, good reminder. because it's been a really rich and wonderful program. So it's time for questions, but we might cut you off if it goes on and on, then speak to us individually. Yeah. About beaver dam analogs? Yeah. Um, so the question was, can I talk a little bit more about beaver dam analogs? I mean, I think, I think that's, that's actually, I think, I think that Jake should take that one. I mean, Jake, Jake did the workshop today, and he's the, the stream restoration professional. Sounds like this is the question. Oh, the question, the question was just a very general, can you talk more about beaver dam analogs? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I got I got lots of thoughts around it. Um, <laughs> but I think what's important is uh, you know adding beaver to any ecosystem is is a, a good idea from a hydrological standpoint. But you really need to have good habitat in place before you do that. If you're going to grow the beaver population there, you intend to move the beaver population uh, back into that place. You need to have good habitat. So beaver dam analogs do that job in a sense. They're kind of like bridging the gap in a sense. So they're they're kind of like uh, <laughs> the humans version. Of, let's see if we can do this. So they, you know, that creates an ecosystem that hopefully a beaver can move in and do the real work. Does that answer your question? Like, 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 how do you build one? <laughs> yeah, honestly, I've never built one myself. But you, uh, yeah, the, kind of the way they are built is uh, it's a post assisted log structure in a sense. So you're, you're taking uh, sharpened logs, branches, trees, um, something sturdy, and you're driving it into a riverbed or a waterway. And then you're weaving sticks, willows, mud, rocks. Into that, you know, that kind of water, and you've got some great picture of doing that set up. Uh, and you're, you're slowing and spreading and sinking the water. Right. So, yeah, so you, so you, you pound these posts in. You know, these guys have chosen straw, which is a, an occasional choice. And you, you're just kind of weaving material in there. And as, Jay, as Jake said, creating that little impoundment that the beaver is going to find attractive. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think that, I mean, I think that one. Uh, you know, scientists are sort of experimenting. I think that one of you know one of the approaches now is like is how how low tech can we get away with, right? So now there are, you know there are, there are projects in Utah that don't actually pound the posts in at all. They just pile a bunch of sticks in there like the beavers would, and say, okay, you know, if this thing washes out in three years, we don't care because it's going to allow the beavers to return now you know, and get reestablished in the system. And we, again, we don't care what happens to the structure in the long term. We just want to jumpstart the beaver's own activity. So, yeah, this is a pretty good picture of you know how it's yeah, often done. That, like, the Smith Fork project we were talking about earlier. Really, the impetus of that project started because one landowner um, was doing just what that described, adding uh, brush and sticks and you know into a waterway to back up water adjacent to Smith Fork, not even on the main channel, mm -hmm. trying to capture some trench flows or some stream flows. And what he saw was an increased vegetation. So building habitat is kind of a, a goal of these things. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks, thanks a lot, Jake. Yeah, yeah learn. Are there any implications for downstream users when it comes to the impoundment? Have you had have you had experience with people that were, be they private landowners or ranchers or whoever? wanting to do this, but then there were complications with the fact that the water was being held upstream and somebody downstream said, well, wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. So there, so there are, there are definitely concerns about, about water rights, um, you know, in large part because look, I mean, in, in, you know, in a, in a beaver pond, um, or in a you know a human created beaver pond, right? I mean, there's a, you know a certain amount of evapotranspiration that's happening. Um, you know, the beavers in general are not they're not taking the water, right? They're just slowing the water down, um, and you know they're they're just you know stabilizing that hydrograph, right? But there are concerns um, that uh, you know that that again that evapotranspiration is going to affect downstream. Um, water rights holders. And there's actually, I mean, there's, I'm sure there's somebody in this room right now who knows more about the uh, draft stream restoration legislation than I do. Who wants to, does anyone want to tackle that? Which is, which is basically legislation that would essentially resolve the, the legality of, of, of stream restoration projects and, you know, and whether, whether a water right is required. Um, that feels like another Jake question, potentially. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, this is good. He's the he's the he's the real expert. I'm just a freaking writer. Um, honestly, I don't know a whole lot about the details of it, but kind of what you're describing is true. Like, so there is legislature that is going through right now about these processes, these natural processes, that really kind of doing a restoration rather than um, impacting these water rights. I think 
think there are a few studies that are out there now that are kind of creating that out to understand what actually is happening with the season. Mm. Uh, we have legislation that's coming through with kind of, you know, move this through as a, a permitting process of uh, you know, all the big alley or that of stuff. We move it through as like this is a restoration technique. Yeah. Hmm. I think that answers some questions. Yeah. Um, and maybe any more questions for Jake? <laughs> yeah. Great. The woman in Gunnison mentioned you can do a lot of interaction with people up and down the river from flying. Yeah. Setting up the beaver to fill up. And also that you work with. Yeah, I think I think that's I think those I think that Ashley made great points last night. Um, that you know, there's a lot of stakeholder engagement that has to happen. A lot of a lot of. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of conversation, a lot of education. I think um, you know certain states. You know, in New, in New Mexico, you actually can't relocate uh, a beaver without having permission from every landowner. Um, I believe in a five mile radius, so not just up and down the stream, but you know, even like up up, up in the uplands, um, which essentially means that it's you know functionally impossible to relocate a beaver because you're never going to have every landowner agree, right? So um, and I, so so that's um, I think obviously a layer too many um, and uh, bad process, but. Um, you know, I, I certainly uh, agree that um, you know you do you do want uh, you know, but look, I mean, it's, but it, but it's also going to be impossible to get every landowner in Colorado to agree um, that beavers are are necessary uh, on the on the landscape, and you know, certainly there is some danger that uh, you know somebody's going to somebody will kill the beavers that you relocate. Um, but you know, in in most cases, beaver relocation. I mean, those animals that are being live trapped and relocated. Are animals that were likely going to be killed anyway, right? Uh, you know, they were in somebody's culvert, and you know, and, and they were going to be gone. Um, so even if you know, even if beavers that you relocate, you know, even if they even if they have a, a, a chance of being killed, you know, you are giving them a new leaf, a, a new lease on life, and you know, ideally they can reproduce um, before they're before they're killed. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. Ben. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Thanks, Allison. Thank you, Ben, and thank everybody. And wasn't it fun to actually meet in person? Yeah, it was so fun to be here.